So, pain mechanisms from mouse to man. We're here at the studio at the European Pain Congress. My name is Dr. Morden Hu, and I'm in the studio to, uh, today, I was gonna say tonight, but today with Assistant Professor Kirsty Bannister from King's College London. Mm -hmm. So you are homegrown, you are from England and you've always lived and worked in England. Yep. And you've been centered around London for quite some time, haven't you? Yeah, so I moved to London to pursue my undergraduate degree in 2000. In? In pharmacology. Um, so 19 years later, I'm officially a Londoner, but I'm originally a Northerner um, and actually associate myself as British rather than English because I'm fluent in Welsh. So, yes, um, but very much stayed w within this island. Yeah, well, that's good. Um, <laughs> I, oh, could we do this in Welsh? That would be fun, wouldn't it? I would understand do you speak absolutely Welsh? nothing. Oh, no, okay. It would just well, be then. fun. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> Maybe next time. Oh, okay. So, would you would you give us sort of a a brief uh, review of what you've done uh, academically so far? Yeah, sure. So, I came and did my undergraduate degree in pharmacology at University College London. When I finished that, I went to do a Master of Research at Imperial College London because I wasn't sure if research was for me. I really enjoyed that year, so then I did my PhD in Epigenetic Mechanisms at Imperial College London. And then when I finished, um, I was invited back to the Pharmacology Department at UCL to do a postdoctoral position for a year um, in pain neuroscience. And I'd never done anything to do with pain at that point of my academic career. But Professor Tony Dickinson was like, no, come, let's give it a try. Let's see if you enjoy it. And I ended up staying with him for 10 years. So I was a postdoctoral research associate with him for a decade. And then I got my uh, faculty position at King's College London two years ago. Yeah, and congratulations. Thank you. It's a great, pla great place. Yeah, I mean, I've... I, well, I they're love all being great there. places, yeah. honestly. Yeah, it's just great to be in London. And I think I work within the Wolfson Centre for Age Related Disease, and there's a number of um, amazing pain laboratories that are researching all different aspects of the, of the underlying pain mechanisms of different pain states. So, for me, as a basic science researcher, uh, it's a great place to be. Let's pick up on that term, so basic science. What, it, what, what do you think that is? What is it to you? So when I'm here at a, a meeting that's so clinical and I'm giving a symposium, I find it really important to point out right at the beginning that I'm a basic science researcher, which is to say I'm not clinical. However, the work I do is very translational, which again is a term that can mean very different things to different people. And what I mean by that is that the basic science research I do in rodents, I use mice and rats, um, we very much try and marry the underlying mechanisms to what happens in man. So my basic science research is um, exactly that. It's very basic. It's understanding the basics of these, of these pain pathways. And we, ha we have another generic term which we call mechanisms. Um, it, it's sort of encapsulating what you're doing to some extent because you're looking at something that happens in rodents and yeah then seeing if the same thing might be happening in humans yes and then that would mean we can use this existing type of medicines or, or pharmacology or maybe new types of pharmacology yeah so what is a mechanism so it's really about understanding a relay that's happening between neuronal pathways so whether we're talking about a peripheral event that's driving nociceptive transmission or whether we're talking about a central event the modulation of pain we're really trying to understand what the relay of pathways are so that somehow in some way we can identify a pharmacotherapeutic target but the first thing that's really important to do is understand how translatable the pathways we find in rodents are to the ex to the pathways that exist in man so there's a lot of, of really important stuff you're saying here and also relating to some of our early interviews because earlier on what people could do and what they did do was what some refer to as electrophysiology, so they would activate a neuron or nerve cell and then they would record from that or different nerve cells. Yeah. And they also did some neuroanatomy, so cutting up stuff and looking at how it looks. Yeah. And it, it, there was sort of a transition at one point, wasn't there, where, where rather than just looking at the action potentials or reading out the action potentials or looking at the anatomy, 
People also started to realize that these synapses and the neurotransmitters, they were very important for this whole thing. Yeah. Could you explain to me, what is a synaptic cleft? So when we talk about um, synaptic transmission, in the context of pain, we're thinking about that place in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, so the first entry to the central nervous system where the pain message has arrived. And so now it has to somehow activate the second order neuron, which is going to project the pain message to the brain. So if we're focusing on the synaptic cleft, we're really just talking about the way in which that first neuron talks to the second neuron in order to allow the pain message to be driven to the brain. So we're talking about a environment where there are presynaptic and postsynaptic um, so receptors. So before the synapse and after the synapse. Yep, so we've got receptors on that first neuron and then we've got receptors on the neuron that's projecting and we're going to have a whole host of molecules released that are going to activate those receptors and allow the pain message to be transduced to the brain. So it's almost like if, if it was a, a cliff like in the real world and you have a cliff so um, you're walking and there's a hole in the ground <clears throat> and it's too large for you to jump it yeah. but you really want to give the message to the other side you can sort of toss a ball yeah. and the ball in this case would be the neurotransmitter or the yes. signaling molecule yeah. and yeah. then the person catching it would be the receptor exactly. on the other side yeah. I even think it's called that in sports so <laughs> I can relate to that yeah exactly then the person on the other side who's now holding the ball now has the message and so then the message will continue until it gets to the next synaptic cleft, which will happen in the brain. Um, and so then exactly the same thing happens. The ball has to be passed to the other side in order that then the third neuron in the pathway can carry the pain message to the relevant area. And, and the, the really, I, I'm not going to say tricky, but it's not that tricky, but I think a place where some people stumble is that it's not actually the ball that's been transmitted. The, the ball does something, doesn't it? So it, it creates what we call action potentials or electrochemical yeah. signals that then are transmitted again. And then yeah. these signals then make a new ball go out and hopefully being catched. And then yes. is, is that sort of correct? Yeah, so what we're talking about, the ball is, and you know, the person catching it, there's your receptor pharmacology right there. So you're activating the person is the receptor of the ball. It's actually the receptor of the pharmacology in action, whatever that might be. And then that will then transduce the message by generating action potentials. And it's by the transmission of those action potentials that the message is actually relayed. The ball doesn't actually carry on going along. That, no, that but it, sometimes, you know, metaphors, sometimes they seem so easy to understand that, that it's easy to just go with a metaphor. Yeah. But the science is actually quite a bit more difficult and complex. Yeah, although, you know, at, at its most basic, pharmacology is a very simple topic. It's a very simple subject. We're simply trying to know, understand uh, receptor molecule interactions and what activity that drives. So there's nothing to be scared of with pharmacology in that sense because it is a very simple basic science which is one of the reasons I like it so much. When we do basic pharmacology we're asking really simple questions with simple outputs that are therefore quite easy to understand. Yeah there's so, no so let's just follow that so now now there's a signaling molecule and there's a transmission and the signal comes up towards the, the spine so along the spine towards the brain and then there would be these descending pathways as well, right? Yeah. And, and this is sort of where, where you kick in. Yeah, so traditionally, or not traditionally, I think when you speak to lots of people, you know, do you understand pain perception? They would say, yeah, you know, maybe we have a noxious stimulus at the periphery. The pain message reaches the brain through these magic pathways. Um, and then, you know, we perceive pain, but actually, it's not true. What we have is a really important dialogue between those ascending pathways, but then descending pathways. Yeah, so ascending meaning going upwards. Yeah, the ascending pathways going from the spinal cord up to the brain. And then a dialogue between those and descending pathways that go back from the brain to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord to actually modulate the pain that we are perceiving. Yes, because this is a, a very tricky point because we, we as scientists use jargon sometimes. So we will we would use words like you do like pain receptor or something or pain signal which is not really the truth because it's not really pain that's coming obviously it? it's not a ball it's not it's actually electricity isn't it yeah and then the thing that you've been studying is that there's also signals going down mm. which can then influence the final product 
Yes. Which is you can actually perceive more pain or less pain yeah. than actually the stimulus would normally qualify. Absolutely. So that's exactly what these descending modulatory controls are doing. And they're also called top-down controls. You know, people give them all kinds of names. It basically means any control that's running from the brain to the spinal cord. And what I think can be confusing is that we describe them as being bidirectional. So in people's minds, then they think we're talking about the ascending and the descending, but bidirectional simply means exactly what you just said, which is that these descending pathways, top-down processing, can actually make the pain better or worse. So when descending modulatory controls are called bidirectional, that's what we mean, that yep. they can actually facilitate or inhibit the pain response. So turn up, turn down, the perception of pain. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and why is pharmacology important in this context what does pharma what what is your sort of thing so what i try and understand is what can influence the final output of those descending modulatory pathways and the final output is in the dorsal horn where the spinal nociceptive processing happens so if we want to understand what modulates final output there the obvious thing to do is look at pharmacology so we can block specific receptor types um, we can we can um, agonize specific receptor types and yeah, then so we can turn them see, on or activate them yeah. yeah and while we're doing this we can record with an electrode from these neurons we do this in a whole animal so it's an in vivo prep which means the animal is breathing it's alive it's anesthetized um, and we can apply topical application of a pharmacological agent and see how it impacts that spinal nociceptive process. Let me just try and see if I get this right. So we, you do something to an anesthetized animal and the, we, we can measure that there are signals going up. There are also signals coming down again. Yeah. And then what you're measuring is actually the net result yes. of this whole process. Yes. Because we were talking about the bowl before, so you can actually measure what, what type of bowls uh, or, or receptors are present and are they activated or not? Is that, is that correct? So what we can do is we are measuring in the in vivo whole animal situation how these neurons are firing yeah. and we can moderate that how they are firing by making a ball attached to a receptor, making a ball be caught yeah. and that ball might be stopping the message there and then so it doesn't travel onwards or it might be facilitating the traveling of that message. So very much when we are doing these spinal neuronal recordings, we're seeing the impact of what's happening when we activate receptors, for example. And this is very important for the translation, translational aspects, isn't it? Because yeah. you're, other than, of course, the animal uh, at some point will be sacrificed and you are reading out of its neurons, what you're really doing, the thing you are doing to the animal, other than measuring, is actually not that in, uh, um, uh, interventional. So. No. You're doing something to the animal that you could also to do to humans. Yes. So in that sense, the translation is almost one to one. Yes. Knowing that it's not the same species, of course. Yes, but exactly. I mean, obviously, we can't put an electrode in the dorsal horn of, uh, of a human. Uh, but what we can understand is what pharmacologies might reduce a pain message that then can be extrapolated to the clinic. Yeah. So, for example, we would find out what's that, what's happening in the naive animal, so in a, and then extrapolate that to and, a healthy human volunteer. And what does that volunteer. mean? It's, it hasn't gone to school. What does it mean? It's naive? <laughs> so sorry, naive meaning it's uh, it's pain free, like so a healthy human volunteer and a naive animal, a control animal. Yeah. No, you're quite right. <laughs> we we call them naive just because they've not been exposed to a, a chronicity. And nobody's complained so far. Not so far. No. <laughs> Not until now. Okay, let's just do a short um, bit of the basics here again. So when we talk about these molecules, these signaling molecules and neurotransmitters and receptors, what would be the names that people would see if they were looking in a textbook? So the key um, neurotransmitting mod molecules would be serotonin, which um, is 5-hydroxytryptamine, or noradrenaline. So they're the key monoaminergic um, neurotransmitters that are driving nociceptive processing in terms of descending modulatory controls. So if, if you do something to the animal that is considered nociceptive yeah. and you would expect the animal to perceive some sort of pain if it wasn't anesthetized, then you apply something, so you call them agonists or antagonists, yeah. that would either open 
or close the receivers, the receptors. Yeah. yeah. And by doing that to receptors that are sensitive to 5-HT or serotonin yeah. or noradrenaline, yeah. then you can see what effects it has. Yeah, exactly. So, for example, um, the story with serotonin is more complex because it can activate receptors that make pain better or receptors that make pain worse. So if we just think about the situation of a serotonin receptor that makes pain worse, if we block that using ondansetron, ondansetron is used in the clinic as an anti-emetic, if we block that receptor at the level of the spinal cord, we reduce all our neuronal activity. And that's called 5-HT3 or? 5-HT3 receptor, yeah. that's a facilitatory receptor. So if we antagonize that with ondansetron, we reduce our neuronal output so it's seen to be inhibitory and is that relevant for can you use that for then translating that into humans so actually serotonin no not for this one because we're talking about a direct spinal application so when we're just wanting to understand basic spinal pharmacology that's when we will do these kind of experiments that have a topical application. Obviously in the clinic it's not possible to do that, which is why ondansetron in the clinic is used as an antiemetic rather than a pain reliever. It's yeah. not an analgesic. So, so when you say topical, it's not a cream. It's, well, it could be, no, but sorry, you put it yeah, straight direct onto the, application yeah, to the, the spinal, cord. spinal cord. Yeah, exactly. So the problem being that if you had it as a tablet, it might not go into the right places exactly. because of the size of the molecule? Or, yeah, or and it's that? a very localized effect. So there are serotonin receptors all around your body. When you take a, an oral dose of um, on Dancetron, it's not going to have a localized effect in the spinal cord, which means it's not going to inhibit neuronal firing. So that's why we wouldn't use it as an analgesic. Does, is there any sort of normal, the drugs are not normal, I mean, we shouldn't be using we shouldn't need to take drugs if we were not you know in some sort of need yeah but are there some pharmacology um, products some some medicines that are approved to treat pain that include noradrenaline and serotonin yeah. today so we can think about the SNRI so the serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors yeah. that are they're usually also categorized as antidepressants right they are which can be a real issue so the descending modulatory pathways are governed by this activity of noradrenaline and serotonin in the spinal cord. And when we have an imbalance of those um, neurotransmitters, we need to redress the balance. And the SNRIs, if we think about, um, well, Roboxetine would be an NRI. Tepentadol has a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor um, element to it. And actually that's very translational, so too is Roboxetine. But patients, if they have a certain pain state, might be prescribed an SNRI. And then they go home and they look it up and they say, well, this is an antidepressant, I'm not depressed. But actually, the mechanism of action means that it is very applicable to be used in a chronic pain situation. And I guess it's one of these jargon things again, because you're not really treating depression. No. You're doing something to the nervous system to yeah. exactly the receptors you've been talking about, yeah, isn't it? Exactly. You're, you're making it more available, basically. So yeah. if it's the ball metaphor again, you're just making it better for the guy who's throwing it or there's, for the guy catching it. And there's more balls. So there's more chance that the guy's going to catch it because there's more being thrown at him. Yeah. So that's all we're doing is we're stopping those um, neurotransmitters being taken back up to the terminal, which means they're in the synaptic cleft. So we have more of those balls in the synaptic cleft, so the receptor is more likely to Yeah, and to it, catch it was it. used to begin with in people with depression, but um, it's... A se well, like with most drugs, the, the serendipity of the anticonvulsants, you know, when you think about gabapentin and pregabalin, and now they're frontline therapies for neuropathy. I mean, we can trace that all the way back to the, uh, the opiums. When you think about the tribes that would drink the milk of the opium poppy, and then they realized in the elderly generation that they felt better. It's the same. We, we have so many drug discoveries that are by serendipity and actually are treating something that they were not intended to treat. With the SNRIs and the SSRIs, there is a real issue that patients do not want to take an antidepressant. But yeah, but they were never antidepressants. They were meant to activate the nervous system or, or yeah. give the nervous system better opportunities. And yeah. that sort of 
That's been used in pain as well. And you, you yes. mentioned uh, the anticonvulsants as well, so anti-epileptic medicines. Yes. That's sort of the same story. Yeah. What's the pharmacology? Just briefly, what, how does that work? So the pharmacology of the, of the uh, gabapentin oils is fascinating. I'm such a pharmacology geek. So <laughs> how they work, it was discovered, is that... Um, in, so these are state-dependent drugs. What does that mean? means that you are only going to see an effect if you have a pain state. So as opposed to diamorphine, for example, heroin, when I went into labor, the first thing my midwife did was give me an injection of diamorphine and I was sent to heaven for three hours while before I got my epidural. Now, I was in a real bad pain state when I was given this diamorphine, but on the street, illicit use, people are going to experience an amazing euphoria when they take this drug. So it's not state dependent. With pregabalin and gabapentin, there's a state dependency, which is based on a number of molecular changes that occur in patients with neuropathic pain. One of them is that there's increased movement of the voltage-gated calcium channel to the cell membrane, which means that more action potentials can be transduced and the pain message relayed along that, that neuron are gonna be higher. So what the gabapentino gabapentinoids do is they actually target an auxiliary subunit of that channel to stop it being trafficked to the cell membrane. And in that way, there is less pain transmission. So, it's, so, so an easy way to understand this, if I'm correct, is that epileptic seizures would happen or are consisting of uncontrolled, spontaneous activity of brain neurons, brain cells. And they use this drug to sort of tamper it down? Yes, exactly. Less electrical current. And then, like. then we know that there are some people with damage to their nerves who also have pain. They, they have a similar state that's been measured and, and it seems like a really good idea to maybe try and tamper their nervous system down yeah. as well. Yeah. And it turns out to be something that is quite helpful for some people. It's incredible. I mean, when you look at the, the animal studies that look at the immunofluorescence of this, of this subunit of the channel, and you look on the side, uh, it's lateral to the nerve injury. So, you know, you invoke a nerve injury on the left side of the animal, and then you look on the left side of the spinal cord, and you see a huge upregulation of this component of the channel, um, which is then targeted very effectively by these drugs that stop that channel being trafficked to the membrane. Yeah. So it's, it's incredible. And the state dependence of all this is related to the fact that there is, there is a, um, you, you need the nervous system to sort of be overactive before you will have state. the effect on pain. So yeah. if you don't have a nervous system that is overreacting, yeah. you could take gabapentinoids and it wouldn't really help you. No, is, is you'd probably correct? just feel a bit nauseous. Yeah, so you could get the side effects, tired. couldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately you would, exactly. But in terms of a relief state, you wouldn't get it because you have to have the state dependency which differs from opioid-based drugs, for example. And just coming a bit back to the mechanisms that we started about, so we've discussed serotonin, noradrenaline, and now we just touched upon some of the pharmacology that relates to that descending modulation as well. Is there any other molecule targets, me mechanisms uh, involved in the descending modulation of nociception? Any other targets? Um, so you, so you, you, you talked about opioids. Are they also targeting this descending system? Well, I mean, the opioids have a very big role to play in the brainstem in terms of RVM projection. So, th so the RVM are, is a bit of the brainstem? Yeah, it's a nucleus in the brainstem. And when I talk about the serotonergic modulation in the spinal cord, the majority of that serotonin is coming from the RVM. So what we have in the, in the RVM is a variety of cells that have receptors on them that will catch the ball if this is an opioid based treatment um, so um, they're called on cells off cells and neutral cells they'll respond differentially to a, a painful uh, stimulus at the periphery so we can have um, a very real effect on the descending modulatory drive via opioids the problem is we wouldn't be able to prescribe opioid-based analgesics for neuropathy because that's not targeting, for example, the underlying mechanism I just spoke about with the voltage-gated calcium channels. So this is why 
um, with opioids, the story is quite complex. There's a real place for opioids in acute pain. Uh, you know, I've had an appendectomy. I very much relied on my cocodamol afterwards. But the two times I gave birth, I was very grateful for some diamorphine. Um, but actually, when you move into a chronic pain state such as osteoarthritis or neuropathy, um, the opioids then are not going to be targeting um, an underlying molecular mechanism that leads to a real um, analgesic effect. However, there still remains a real place and a real need for opioid-based medications um, in palliative care. Um, so end, end of, of life, life care. care yeah. yeah. And, and just stick into the system a, a bit longer. So we have this in, incoming system uh, and then we have the modulatory system that goes up and it, we've only really talked about turning down the signals but it could also turn them off. Yes. But as, as I understand it, you don't necessarily need the incoming input. You could actually, Absolutely. at least theoretically, you could activate it through top down. So really from from your thoughts, perhaps even so from your cortex. Yeah. However, that relates to thoughts. Yeah. But so you could think things like you could be really fearful about a surgery you're going into, or really fearful about. Yeah. having a condition yeah could that then have an effect on this descending system yeah absolutely i mean we've so far you're quite right we've only spoken about peripherally driven pain states but there are centrally driven pain states where there is no injury to the periphery so if you think about fibromyalgia or migraine irritable bowel syndrome we've very much got a centrally driven pain state that is impacted by those top-down modulatory controls which are um enhanced towards facilitation but there's not been a peripheral input so that's a really important area of research is understanding what is driving this central state of hyper excitability in the absence of a peripheral injury i i so again we we've we've got other talks as well talking about the periphery and the central and the descending now these to me at least seems like the three driving principles of pretty much all the neuroscience at the molecular level that's going on. And and these, I think, are like the most targeted mechanisms that we would refer to. The, the studies would be re-evaluated, re, um, of course, like Professor Anthony Dickens uh, have done some great work on the DNIC and, and yeah. others. So what would be the next new thing? Is it this, uh, Are these the only pathways in the body that are relevant or could there be new targets? So I think, we have to understand the basics before we can identify more targets and actually one of the major threads of research that my laboratory do is understanding what's driving um, top-down controls in the basic sense in a healthy human volunteer and in the not uh, naive control animal who doesn't have a pain state so what we're trying to do is understand what these pathways are, where they project from and to, and are they the same in the rat or the mouse as they are in man? Uh, so I think that for me, in terms of what's the next thing that we are looking into, it's that. It's understanding the physiology, anatomy, and functionality of these pathways. And then when we understand them in the normal situation, taking them forward and looking at what happens in a chronic pain state. Because until we know what the normal situation is, we can't be sure when we see dysfunction of the pathway, what about it is abnormal? Because we need to know what's normal. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that makes so much sense and I completely agree with that. And I'm going to ask you here by the end of this to, to extrapolate widely and just give us your best guess. Would, would this system potentially be able to first of all explain to us what chronic pain is and and if so could modulating this system with pharmacology with exercise with cognitive behavioral therapy mm. could that treat cure chronic pain so that the pain goes away forever I mean wouldn't that be great and I would love to be able to sit here and say absolutely as soon as we understand the fundamentals of these top-down controls that we have our one-size-fits-all answer to pain relief I think that that's, I don't want to say it's impossible. I think we should always keep hope. I mean, that's why we do our job because we're eternally hopeful to identify, to pinpoint a part of a pathway that we can absolutely target therapeutically to relieve chronic pain in everybody. The problem with that is that the underlying mechanism driving a chronic pain state is different even if the individuals each have osteoarthritis. What's ultimately driving their pain in each of them will be very different 
because of these cognitive processes. So past issues such as fear, hopelessness, helplessness will escalate the pain level in one of them maybe to a way more unbearable level to the other. So then when we're thinking about targeted therapies, that person will benefit very differently from someone who actually might need the joint replaced. And joint replacement works for a, 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 a decent proportion of these individuals, so then we're not talking about a central component. No. So as much as we now are talking about the central component of pain modulation, there is a significant proportion of patients who benefit massively from knee replacement and they never feel pain again. No. And so theirs was a peripherally driven state. And it, I think you, you, you correlate, or your answer correlates really well with what history shows, isn't it? It's, it's we do a discovery and that really helps a lot of people and then it sort of plateaus out yeah. a minute. Yeah. And looking at medicines in, in terms of pain medication, there's not really been like like a big new discovery for, I don't know how long, maybe 50 years or so? Yeah, it's been a long time. But I think the reason for that is that we still do not understand the basics of these pathways. And in order that we can reveal a new therapeutic target, we have to understand what the pathway is doing in the normal situation. So that then we, when we extrapolate to a pain state, we identify the dysfunction and then we start thinking about targeting it therapeutically. Yeah. So when I think about the basic research, it's basic in that sense of understanding what's happening in the normal situation. Yeah. So my background, clinical training, was as a physiotherapist and yeah. I'm still seeing patients as a, as a consultant in physiotherapy. Um, I don't, I'm a non-prescriber so I can't, I can't even talk about medicines with them. I can hear what they have to say and, but I couldn't advise them. I can tell how it works but I can't, you know, use any medications. Yeah. Uh, so I use non-pharmacological approaches and, and one of them being education of course but also exercise. Would it be possible to use the same methods that you're using to, to study the same molecules and see how exercise could influence chronic pain states? Oh absolutely and you know exercise has a profoundly positive effect on the level of pain that patients feel so we know absolutely that it's hugely beneficial. We might not understand completely why or how, but we know it is beneficial. So often what you you have with the chronic pain patient is this vicious cycle of, of severe depression and anxiety. So then they, they're not gonna leave the house to go for a run. They're certainly not gonna go to the gym. And so actually encouraging patients to a state where they're gonna exercise for long enough that they start to see the rewards because it does take a little time. It doesn't happen after one 5k run and um, that can be that's a challenge to overcome I mean that's for you as a healthcare provider that's a, that's a wall that you have to jump over definitely yeah but it's 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 absolutely beneficial that's been proven yeah well I, I thank you so much for this talk it's been really enlightening and I think there's a lot of things now we can we can relate to and understand and I, I really think the same system that applies to medicines could also be used to understand how non-pharmacological therapies work and it would definitely help us communicate better wouldn't it so yeah. we use the same language for the same things yeah absolutely yeah but thank you so much for your time it's been a pleasure no problem.